is pretty much cleared out. We do have a couple stragglers that just jumped into the ocean. Probably not a safe idea right now as these are some very treacherous conditions with this uh, Tropical Storm Ada now brewing just off uh, into the ocean here. We traveled up north a little bit into Sarasota County at Blind Pass Beach where uh, the sheriff's office at one point today did have some roads blocked off because water was starting to come over the roadways. Yeah, Russ, the water here, as you can see, very deep. The people who live in this neighborhood told me they saw a lot of flooding after Hurricane Irma, but nothing like this. The water is deeper than four feet here in some level, level areas, so it's hard for cars to pass through, impossible in some areas. But let me show you guys how this all happened. Now, crash investigators with Florida Highway Patrol told me the man was backing out of this driveway here when the victim's wife said uh, the driver was speeding down this road going about 108 miles an hour when she actually clipped the back of their car. You can actually still see pieces of that car scattered on the roadway here. Now, the crash caused the car to roll over multiple times, ending up in that ditch over there. The father and his daughter were ejected from the car, and the first responders had to actually cut out the third victim and rush her to the hospital. Golf courses like Fort Myers Country Club hear the critics, so they're making sure each player practices social distancing, providing each golfer with his or her own cart. And as soon as that happens, you'll have to wear one of these inside of a shop, restaurant, or government building. But as soon as you step foot outside, well, then it's fair game. And the city encourages businesses to put up signs like one of these to remind shoppers to cover up to protect everyone. People living here along South Winds Drive, the mayor, they all agree that this is much worse than what they saw after Hurricane Irma. Now, take a walk with me. I want to show you what people living here have been dealing with. The water level all the way up to the front door of this woman's home here. She tells me she can't get out. Even if she wanted to, she couldn't. There's a moat around her entire home here, and the water levels are even deeper in her front yard. These coming about almost to the top of my boots here. Well, police aren't saying a whole lot, except for detectives are still looking for that shooter. So let me show you what's left of that killing scene here. This is shattered glass from that blue car that was parked here about midnight. That car is gone now because inside was where police found a man, 21-year-old Montrell O'Neill. I can tell you the mood has been pure shock and devastation. And if you look at this home right here behind me, you can see just how much damage this tornado caused. Look at those windows over there. They're Boarded up right now, but earlier today they were completely blown out. And look at that roof. That part is virtually non existent. Now I'm going to give you a look at inside this home in just a few moments, but I want to show you something else right now. I'm actually standing in the driveway right now, and I'm going to have my photographer pan down here to show you this brown Kia. That actually belongs to the homeowner whose home I just showed you. But I do want to show you guys right now the deputy car did just get towed out of that ditch just moments ago. The car was actually down here. I want to show you guys if we pan over this way. It went in there. Now you might be wondering how did it get in that ditch? Well, this car right over here in the back of the tow truck, it crashed into this car. The project manager here told me that he really wanted this school to get away from that stigma that schools sometimes look like prison. So that's really the mindset going into this project for them. The district has really high hopes that this school will also help the growing population here in the east zone of the district. We're still seeing and feeling some wind and some rain here. The other thing we're seeing is some choppy waters out here. You can probably hear the waves crashing here in the background, a little bit choppy out there. On this side, you can see that algae green coating the water and it smells pretty bad. But over here where they've put that product, the white you see on top of the water, it's already starting to kill that green algae. Pressure on all sides. First Lee County told them no more panhandling at busy intersections just like this one over the bridge. Now they want them to move out from their tents right behind this old shopping center. Why? Safety concerns both times. Most of us will do just about anything to protect our homes, our families. That's true here with this group of homeless people in North Fort Myers. The biggest problem is uh, all of us trying to stay together. This lot behind a long shut down strip mall is not comfortable or conventional or even legal. But Gracie Lash says this is still a neighborhood. There's a uh, Jessica and Joe. There's Jose, 
Zay's tent, Jose and Harmony's tent. Rico is the one that just walked past. That was his tent. Lee County wants these people out for safety concerns. So Gracie and Jessica and Joe have got to go. Here we go. We have to move them again. Now what do you think happens? That hope gets crushed. Hope and help comes from Lee County's homeless outreach treatment or hot teams and caring people like Lucy Ramirez. She donates her time to get to know the people and the problems they face. I mostly gave them love. I'm going to feed them lunch today. Some recommendations of where they can go, uh, where they won't be on somebody else's property. Some people have packed up their tents already. Gracie, she's going to wait on the rest of her family. Yeah, it's just like real, real hard right now. The Lee County Sheriff's Office told me there is no deadline for people to leave, but those hot teams I mentioned have been out here and will be out here working to get people out. Russ, the man who lives inside of this house told me he came outside to find the suspect looking over inside of his boat, to which he said, what are you doing? The suspect said he was just going for a casual swim in the creek and asked if he could leave through the front of the house. Well, 15 minutes after being escorted back, he, 15 minutes after being escorted out through the front, he was back. But this time, he was being chased by police officers. And he came back and he jumped off the dock into the water. Witnesses said a police officer told him, what are you doing? There are alligators in there. Get out. To which the suspect said, I don't care. What if I want it to happen to me? Leave me alone. Helicopter up. Canine unit called in. We have eyes on him. We've got many resources deployed. Cops lining the street. All to first find, then convince this man to come out of the water. Not good words for being recorded. Like, oh my God. Tyler Pimentel spotted the man in his friend's front yard. He had actually broken into this young woman's house and her daughters were home. So that's why I actually took it upon myself to take my own personal vehicle and kind of drive around probably about an hour. Other neighbors on the street think the suspect tried to get into their houses too. That's when I noticed somebody was in here. Bob Scheib said the suspect hid in his shed. All of these were inside this box. His canoe flipped over with fishing poles inside. Why well, do you want to take my stuff, man? Luckily, it was securely tied. It was on, on the trailer upside down. His boat covered in footprints and lowered into the water. He, um, he couldn't start it because I, I had the kill switch. It's in my shed. After hours of searching for the suspect in Billy's Creek. Of, you know, officers on both sides of the canal, and, and we're kind of just keeping an eye on him, talking to him as he goes. You know, he might be going through a crisis at this point, so we're just trying to give him time. Fort Myers police got him out. I watched as a police officer literally stripped down to just his shorts and said, look, I've got nothing on me. Please come out. Once they got Monroe out of the water, the police officers asked us to give him space because the more people that were around, the more he started to freak out. Police officers that were on scene believe he was going through some sort of mental crisis. Yeah, Lois, if my arms are any indication, the bugs are definitely biting here on Sanibel. Lee County Mosquito Control tells me the mosquitoes that lay their eggs in water, which is still all over roads and in front of some homes here on Sanibel, those can carry West Nile virus. But the control district also tells me all of this water can actually be preventing some breeds of mosquitoes from reproducing. A pool of water surrounds Bobby and Joanne oh Vine's God. house on Sanibel. They've rented for about a decade. Never seen this much water, even during a hurricane. We just never comprehended that a, a foot of water would fall yeah. continuously. We opened it again and the water had breached over the, the, the little step and we kept measuring, looking down, seeing, trying to figure out if it was going to end up coming in the house. In the house. The vines are not alone. Standing water is still covering many yards after Tropical Storm Sally dumped heavy rain on the island this weekend. Just because we had rain, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a big emergence of mosquitoes. Some areas breed more than others. But Lee County Mosquito Control is taking no chances. Crews are out in full force, checking for eggs in the water. But Deputy so Director really Eric Jackson important. told me the heavy rain could actually help keep the mosquito population down. Is that when you have a lot of water, 
that it, there's so much that it floods that it connects with other bodies of water that already have fish in it, those fish will start moving into those flooded areas and you've got a natural form of control. You've got a biological control that's feeding on that mosquito larvae. While the water slowly recedes, the vines have their bug spray ready. I was out sweeping the porch and there was this mosquito flying around looking at me and I kept like that. I kept saying, <laughs> you go away, I don't need you. And this water here in some parts of Sanibel not going away anytime soon. If you have standing water like this outside of your home, Lee County Mos uh, Mosquito Control District wants you to put on that bug spray. And they also want you to take a walk around your home and dump out any containers that might be full of water where mosquitoes can lay their eggs. Look, Shelly. There are just some things. How are you doing there in New Jersey? Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Brooklyn okay. You can't find in a grocery store. The social gathering, too. Yeah. Hello there. Something sweet. Three days from now, that'll be the sweetest, ripest mango that you'll ever find. They're down to earth. The regular folk, down to earth people. Something solid. We're on a first name basis. Not hey you or whatever. I'm Phil. That's Bob. Something that isn't just customer service. This is friendship. <laughs> Decades in the making. How many friends do you think you've made doing this? I couldn't count them all. That's how long Bob sold his produce at the North Fort Myers flea market. Phil is proof those friendships are strong. Well, I came up as a customer and we got chatting and things like you and I are right now. Been doing that for going on 20 years with this guy right now. After almost 60 years this slice of old Florida, the North Fort Myers flea market, is no more. Uh, most of my life I've been coming here. It's been one of the best markets I've ever had. And today's the last and final day. It's gone. But not forgotten. Bob and Phil will still sell their produce on Wednesdays, but down the street at the Shell Factory. Well, we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Chris, that 19-year-old was actually crying as he first walked out of these two doors. But Chris, that is all we would get. He refused to answer any of our questions. Logan, did you do it? Did you kill Layla Aiken? Today, one of our first looks at the teenager Cape Coral police say hit and killed an 8-year-old girl at her bus stop on March 25th. Anything to say to the Aiken family? Logan Hetherington refusing to answer any questions as he walked to his parents' car Friday afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Hetherington. This just hours after a judge set a $133,000 bond for the teen now facing felony charges. His defense attorney assuring his client is not a flight risk. He currently works, he's had a job since high school. The family owns property and business uh, locally. He does have nine siblings ranging from 11 to 27. Cape Coral Police announced Logan Hetherington's arrest Thursday afternoon after a two month investigation into the hit and run death of second grader Layla Aiken. Police have the red pickup truck they say killed the little girl and video they say of their suspect getting into that truck minutes before the crash. Were you in the red pickup truck that hit Layla Aiken? No response from that 19 year old or his parents this afternoon. That suspect is expected back in court next month. They're in eighth grade now. As middle schoolers, Gabriella, Joan, and Jocelyn earned the right to sit at the back of the bus. We have like a lot of little kids, and like we have to take care of those, and we're like the bigger ones in the bus. And they knew what to do when their bus driver pulled over to the side of the road and parked. He fell on the floor. And then I started saying, my bus driver passed out. The voice on the other side of the radio told Joanne to move his driver and check her pulse. There's little kids on the bus, and yeah, and I just wanted to be as calm as possible. Meanwhile, Jocelyn called the school. I took my phone, like, kind of, like, peeked out to hear them better. Gabriella made more calls, first to 911, then to moms and dads. So there were 17 kids on the bus and 10 of them were elementary schoolers. So of course, like they freaked out. A lot of them were crying and I just like they needed somebody to talk to that they knew because of course I didn't know them all personally. So they needed to talk to someone who could like help them. So because of them, everyone is safe. 
including the driver. I am proud for all the students. Yeah, I am very happy, very, very happy. Safe, because sometimes it's okay if kids don't act their age. She could have died and, and the other kids were just panicking and just stepped into action and just did what I had to do. Yeah, Tyler, uh, Tyler Raver told me he heard the crash and came running. When he got here, he actually saw two adults sitting on the bank of the canal. They told him there were two kids inside the car that was sinking, so he jumped right in. Even in the dark, you can feel the urgency, sense the tragedy. In the light, you can see from the Wink News drone how a car traveled from the road, through the grass, into the air, and landing in this canal. Tyler Raver heard the crash and came running. I ran out my front door. It had to have been 30 seconds. By the time I got to that canal, they were already on the other side of the bank, the parents. And once I got into the water, I asked if there was other people in the vehicle, and they said, yes, two small children. Ravert said all he saw was the roof of the car. The rest of the car was underwater. With lives at stake, Ravert jumped into the water while his yeah. wife called 911. It's so what you do when you're a father. So it just kicks in. We're in desperate need of flight. They still have what they believe is one child trapped. I tried to open the doors, tried to break out a window until an officer got there with a baton and he broke open a window and we pulled out a child. That child, a boy, didn't make it. Ravert said the two children must have been underwater for at least five minutes, probably more. And we were trying to break another window to try to get the child out and we couldn't, we couldn't do it. And then a, uh, a diver showed up and within a couple minutes he had the other child. It, it's devastating. but. I did what I could, and so did the officers and firefighters and EMTs. So. Ravert told me he's devastated the boy he tried to save didn't make it. And angry, Cape Coral police say alcohol and or drugs are a factor in this crash. They're precious. That's, that's the world, our children. Just set a good example. Now let me show you exactly how investigators reconstructed this crash. The car came down this road and through this big patch of grass here, you see this orange paint on the ground marks the path they took right into the canal. Now the two adults that were in that car are in the hospital tonight, but they're going to be okay. That second child that was pulled out of the car is fighting for his life. Well, let me show you. About two weeks ago, I would be waiting in the canal here. A few months ago, the family here docked their boat. Now a boat would likely get stuck high and dry, even in a canal here or maybe stuck in the mud. Meet Esther Silvis. Pretty soon we can just like play baseball out here probably. And Brian Sheehan. They're dead in the water, no pun intended. But. They are neighbors who live along this freshwater canal with a low level problem. Because you buy waterfront property and you pay waterfront taxes and <laughs> you're not getting waterfront. The city of Cape Coral told me it's pumping more than 15 million gallons of reservoir water a day into more than 300 miles of freshwater canals. 15 million gallons of water would fill nearly 23 Olympic sized swimming pools. I don't know where they're pumping them to, not to my canal. Well, it's disappointing. I bought this house. I mean, it was a complete rehab. Sheehan lives right across the water. It wasn't the house that I was looking for. It was the location. This is the reason that I bought right here. You might recognize him. We've talked with him before on Wink News, starting when he beached his boat in this canal. Time went on. This does nothing but disappoint. In 2018, Cape Coral and Fort Myers agreed to build a pipeline across the Clusahatchee to send reclaimed water to the Cape. That will help the city maintain freshwater canal levels during the dry season. But that pipeline is not done, and patience, it's wearing thin. This was the inspiration for coming down here, moving to Florida, living on the water. It's nice. It's nice to have in here in, in Cape Coral. There must be something that can be done.